everything I do is about the primary sources. Um, basically, I had, I, I'm going to write a wonderful essay, because well, it's already got a great title, Breakfast with Patty. <laughs> and uh, Patty made me realize that what I am is a, a humble miner. I, I produce raw materials. Um, you know, an, an indust on an industrial scale so that you clever people can analyze them to death. <laughs> uh, so I, I've got a pile of cards there. So if, anybody, if I can be helpful to MD, I'm here to inform you with my discoveries. Um, uh, as, uh, consider me your non-native guide. Like uh, James Connolly said this morning, you know, like, Sometimes you need a very different perspective, and the last people we should be allowed to, to speak here are, are Western scholars. <laughs> so, um, exile from exile is an, an endlessly recurring theme in Jewish history, and it comes as no surprise to, to discover a, a parallel experience involving Indians uh, from Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Um, in Black Elk Speaks, John G. Nyhart recounts the story of how Black Elk, with a number of Lakota companions, was left behind in England at the end of Buffalo Bill's 1887-88 season. Um, the, the party of stranded Indians made their way to London where they proposed to give shows in the hope of paying the passage home. They were fortunate enough to meet up with Mexican Joe a small-time imitator who rode in Buffalo Bill's coattails. Um, after our London season, uh, Mexican Joe took his trip to Paris where the show played for a while. Since first published in 1932, the, the story has been um, uh, paraphrased by innumerable authors, few of whom, if any, have offered fresh perspectives beyond the occasional in injection of confusions and inventions of their own. The lack of original research generally has been up until now deplorable, and now it becomes intolerable. Um, anyway, I would like to focus your attention on one particular uh, passage from Black Elk Speaks. Um, from Paris, we went into Germany, and from there uh, to a place where the earth was burning. There was a tall butte shaped at the top like a teepee, and it was burning up there. I heard that a long time ago a big town and many people disappeared in the earth there. Um, the accompanying footnote offers the natural inferences that Mexican Joe's show apparently visited Naples. Here we are at Napoli, uh, viewed uh, as it is best viewed from a distance from the, the hills above uh, Sorrento. Um, I think that this place should actually have a twinning arrangement with Cody because one day that uh, th th that uh, uh, volcano is going to blow. And it's just like the same here in Cody. You know, a hard rain is going to fall when, when Yellowstone finally goes up. Um, uh, and I uh, apparently visited Naples, uh, where Black Elk learned about, Pom uh, learned about Pompeii. Now this is Pompeii, I know I took that photograph because Lucy didn't come uh, with me that day, but that in the background is uh, the butte with the TP at the, at the, at the shape to the top. Um, the only further uh, clarification, clarification required here is that the tall butte is of course Vesuvius, uh, the volcano which erupted with such devastating effect in 79 AD. Um, there is, of course, a happy ending. Sometime later, the time scale is never adequately explained. Mexican Joe returned to Paris. But by this time, uh, Black Elk was in such a ruinous state of health that he had to be left behind in the care of, a f of the family of a girlfriend he had met in his previous sojourn in the city. Um, sometime later, he hooked up again with Buffalo Bill when he came to Paris for the 1889 season. Buffalo Bill famously gave his former employee a dinner at $90 in his fair home. The following year, um, a, a black elk became involved in the ghost tra dance trouble of 1890. Now, this, this story has enthralled me for many years, but it raises certain questions in my mind. Um, firstly, is Nyhart's account of what black elk, to, uh, black elk told him the final word? 
can we at least fulfill the limited objective of applying a more definite timeline? Can we find extrinsic evidence which would enable us to construct a viable commentary? Does the historical record support or contradict the story? So, uh, some specific questions. How many other Indians were left behind with Black Elk? Who were they? Most compelling of all, did Mexican Joe really take Black Elk to Italy? Um, since I have just 20 minutes in which to impress a bunch of people I, I usually only see in the History Channel, I must condense a year's, if they bother to turn up that is, <laughs> I, I must condense a year's of research and refer to my sources only in passing. I, I have, however, carefully noted the, the key quotations in a separate, separate work file which I'll happily pass on to Andy who, who, who uh, would like to have it. Now, um, this incidentally is uh, the, the print-on-demand version of a, a little book, I told you it was a little book, uh, which I did as a, a brand book for the English Westerner Society, Black Elk, Mexican Joe and Buffalo Bill, The Real Story. Uh, that is actually available via uh, my website. My website's got the link to uh, the relevant page. Um, a further uh, print-on-demand version of my book on Viola Clemens and the White Lily Company is going to be upon us shortly. Um, now, the, the first and most obvious external source is the Sixth Grandfather, which is principally composed of the original interview transcripts. Serious difficulties arise when comparison with the, the, the Black Elk Speaks text is attempted. There are conflicts and important points of detail in almost every connection. Many of the, the most spectacular and routinely quoted passages are without direct equivalent in the transcripts, and we have to conclude that, that they were um, poetic interpolations of Nihats. Uh, Nihats, I should say. I would also contend that mistakes were made in the translation process. Uh, in particular, serious confusion appears to crept in on elementary points of European geography. Mexican Joe's movements during the period in question can mostly be reconstructed from the contemporary uh, newspaper reports. A careful comparison creates further problems. His actual itinerary diverges substantially from that outlined by Nyhart. Uh, Black Elk unquestionably participated in Black Elk, uh, Buffalo Bill's 1887 tour of England. He is listed fictitiously as a Cheyenne in the official program. Uh, now, uh, here we are, um, th that's the Wild West Company in London. If we go one forward, that's the detail that shows Black Elk. Um, uh, this is another a picture which uh, you'll all be thoroughly familiar with, but uh, that's him with a friend called Elk. Um, the Wild West spent nearly six months in London, next reopening for a short season at the Aston Lower Grounds, Birmingham, on Saturday, 5th November, 1887. On Tuesday, 29th November, shortly before the show left Birmingham, two Lakota Indians um, from Buffalo Bill's company named Blackbird and Choice appeared before the Aston uh, magistrates and were convicted of offences relating to drunkenness, arriving out of two separate incidents in the previous evening, Monday 28th. Blackbird had been, uh, I got rather excited and did some damage to the arresting officer's uniform. Choice, however, was virtually unconscious when arrested in the Crown Inn in Church Lane and therefore did not resist. Um, the point of this anecdote becomes apparent when we read, when we read Raymond de Marley's statement in his introduction to the Sixth Grandfather. He, that's Black Elk, signed two contracts with Buffalo Bill that year, 1886. He used his boyhood name Choice, Kanigapi, his official de designation in the Pine Ridge census at that time. Neither of the na Black Elk narratives uh, mentions this brush with the law. The overwhelming tone of both is the deep melancholy, homesickness and ill health which, which he suffered during his time abroad. This intimation of a fondness for alcohol uh, casts an entirely new perspective upon his personality, prompting us to a revaluation of these negative experiences as well the, the manner in which he came to be left behind. <coughs> um, after Birmingham came a, a lengthy indoor uh, winter season at the Manchester Racecourse in, in Salford. It's actually Salford, Frank, not Salford. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, opening 17th December 1887. Um, more than four months later, the Wild West departed Salford's Windsor Bridge cattle uh, siding at 11 o'clock on the morning of Friday, 4th May 1888. The Manchester Times of, of, of 5th May 1888 provides a, a graphic out, a, account that, that, but uh, included as a statement, the leave taking was a prolonged one for every member of the troop, including the Indians, seemed to have numerous friends from whom they were loath to part. Uh, there were, however, cer a, a certain conspicuous absentees, for this was the start of uh, Black Elk's great misadventure, when he and his friends failed to rejoin the company. Um, both, um, uh, both narratives agreed that an initial party of four, including Black Elk, managed to lose themselves. According to, the, to Black Elk speaks, they were joined by two other Lakotas. In the sixth grandfather, however, this is two other men. Page, uh, 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 yeah, the trains took the, 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 the tourage on to Hull, where a single performance was given on Saturday 5th before setting sail on board the Persian monarch in the, the early hours of uh, Sunday 6th. Now, uh, if, Bill Go uh, if Bill Garlow has made one contribution to humanity, it is to make the point that um, uh, the Wild West needs accountants. Now, here's a neat piece of double entry accounting. Um, th this great institution holds a cabin plan outlining the arrangements for the passage home. With the exception of Chief Redshot, the Indians are not individually named, but are summarized as 48 bucks, two squaws, and one baby boy. <coughs> this yields a total of 51 steerage Indians who are expected to travel. The passenger list reveals that 47 steerage Indians actually did make the crossing, including two women and a four-year-old boy, leaving four adult male Indian males accounted for. This figure is um, confirmed by an outstanding feature appearing in the Hull News 12 May 1888, entitled Round the Coast with Buffalo Bill. Its author was a journalist who sailed with the wide World West from Hull to Portland, Dorset, before disembarking two days later having enjoyed considerable access to his host in the meantime. It is difficult to ascertain except, uh, exactly what an Indian thinks, but it is beyond all question that those forming Colonel Cody's troop had their ideas very much enlarged by the visit to England. And, and four of them at least have become so enamored of English civilization that they declined to put in an appearance when their companions left Manchester on Friday last for four of the number did not answer the, to the roll call. And where they are now, I do not know. They did not turn up as it thought they might do at Portland, and the steamer sailed away without them. Um, the, the same comparison also discloses that two others failed to sail, or, or more probably consciously decided not to. Um, one was, uh, was Pedro Esquivel. Um, and Esquivel's subsequent involvement in Mexican Joe's show is clearly documented and he appears in the UK 1891 census in Jaro, which one of my great-great-grandfathers came from, um, uh, where Mexican Joe was appearing that spring. Later that same, Pedro uh, uh, Esquivel re-enlisted with Buffalo Bill and the, during his time in Glasgow joined the Masonic Lodge. This is the actual uh, beast. Um, oh, hang on, that wasn't meant to happen. Yeah, well, that's time's going in, but Pedro Escovel's name's on that. I can certainly email it to anybody who wants to see it. Um, there's a picture of Mexican Joe. Um, I'll show that shortly. In fact, I'll just leave it on the census in case you want to look at it. Pedro's sidekick was a man presently known uh, to me only as Willis. Whether this was his first or last name, I do not know. Now, this is the bit that really bothers me because uh, my perennial inspiration, Lieutenant Colombo, uh, usually says, you know, yeah, so that's one thing that bothers me. Here's what's, what bothers me. <laughs> the show left Manchester on the morning of Friday the 4th. It didn't, sh it didn't sail until Sunday the 6th in the early hours. Now, Black Elk and his friends actually had the whole of Friday and Saturday to get the next train. They obviously didn't know, and when you read the, the Black Elk text, uh, it's quite obvious that they, they thought that the, the boat was sailing that night. Now, I would like to make the, the, the specific accusation that Petro and Willis kept this from them. 
I think there was a degree of, of a manipulation. They were already in contact with Mexican Joe and they were actively lining up recruits. So while this drama was unholding, uh, unfolding in Salford, Mexican Joe was in Taunton in the Wild West Country. So the West Country, a, a hostless and presumably not very impressive imp version of the show uh, played to a half empty a Yeovil Town Hall on the 1st of May. Mexican Joe did not know around the corner, or was just around the corner. There again, maybe he did it. Uh, right, from 12th May to 12th June, Mexican Joe was a star attraction at London's uh, at Alexandra Palace, where in the early part of this season he enlisted the refugees from, from Buffalo Bill's show. Now, here are some pictures of, of Mexican Joe. This was him in Liverpool not long after he arrived in August 1887 for the Liverpool exhibition. That's another of them in the same session. That's um, a handbill, uh, Buffalo Bill outdone. This is actually um, his entourage sometime after the Lakotas left. Uh, that's a surviving photo I got from um, of the grandson of the gentleman at the top far right. And th that's a poster I got from another relation by marriage and that's the detail of the poster, and that's the biggest load of lies I've ever heard. <laughs> I'll come back and tell you about it all another time. Or maybe you'll read my book on the subject. Uh, this, is a, um, th this is a dime novel uh, from the early part of the 20th century, uh, and it is the same Mexican, Joe Shelley. Um, um, so Alexandra Palace was one of the great entertainment complexes of the late Victor Victorian age. Another of the, the other grand attractions there was a weekly spectacular, the d dramatic representation of Lord Lytton's 1834 novel, The Last Days of Pompeii. Uh, the eruption, which was simula simulated with pyrotechnics, came precisely as the protagonist, Glaucus, was denounced as a Christian. In mid-June, Mexican Joe opened at Noyley, Paris, exactly as the Black Elk narratives describe, and remained there until early August. However, uh, from, from, um, from Paris, the Wild West, as a Mexican Joe, did not go to Germany. Either, uh, on either Saturday 4th or Sunday 5th, the, contact, uh, the sources conflict uh, of August, uh, the show opened at the Exposition Universelle in Brussels, Belgium. The last notice I have of him there was on 21st September, uh, when he was embroiled in a court case, as he generally was. Um, now, the clear impression uh, created by the Black Elk narratives is of that of a more or less perpetual tour of the, the um, a European continent before eventually returning to Paris. I began this research project with an open mind and was prepared to accept that Black Elk speaks was the literal truth. However, the point where the wheels really came off the wagon was when I discovered that on Saturday, 13th October, 1888, Mexican Joe opened at the Bingley Hall, Birmingham, England. At first, I was disposed to accept that maybe he returned to England for a time before going back to the continent. Um, and, 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 however, so far as I've been able to determine, he never crossed the channel again, certainly not while Blackout was his, em his employee. We are therefore left with what, just one brief window of about three weeks in which Mexican Joe and Black Elk might have, uh, have fitted in a brief tour, a, a visit to Naples somewhere between Brussels and Birmingham. But a most reliable, later formed, Grazie Mille Alessandra, uh, that, that given the state of the Italian railway network at the time, this would have been utterly impractical. Sam, where are we? Uh, you've already given me that. Oh, sorry, right, I'm gonna have to be very quick. Um, I, I went to Rome for a couple of weeks and looked up the Corriere di Napoli for the, the relevant uh, dates and um, there's no sign of Mexican Joe. Um, um, one picture I must show you, Mexican, uh, 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 Black Elk mentioned a fire in Birmingham. It hap this is it, it happened on Tuesday the 26th of, of February uh, 1888. Oh, sorry, 1880, hang on, I'm getting mixed up. Yeah, well, yeah, 1889, sorry. In that me context, he mentions the other Indians who were left behind. Those were, or two of them, two were High Bear and, and two Elk. The other one was a man called Charles Picketpin. 
Um, so anyway, I, anyone who wants to see the full text of this, I'm going to have to cut it short. Um, please email me. I will send you the transcript. Um, but anyway, I would like to contend that the show, Mexican Joe's show, never met, went to Napoli. But that's where he, Black Elk was exposed to that story in London. He learned about Pompeii, yes, but in London. And that informed um, his involvement in the, 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 the uh, ghost dance movement. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for bearing with me.